You know, one of the interesting things about Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday and doing Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday, other than having it as just a fun time, is how many of people have owned Ugly Christmas Sweaters and not known that they were Ugly Christmas Sweaters? How many people were given Ugly Christmas Sweaters and the people didn't know that they were Ugly Christmas Sweaters as they were being given to you? They thought they got you this wonderful gift that would just fit you so well. But yet... There are all times when you look back on the, on the family heirlooms and the family albums in life, have you noticed the fashion trends that have seemed to come and go and come back and come back and go again and they seem to be on that cycle there? And at one point in time, you really thought you looked good probably. And now you look back on that and you go, people let me out of the house looking that way. And I guarantee you that one day you will look at pictures of yourself today and go, I look like that? Really? Someone didn't tell me? That was a hideous outfit, but you had it on. You know, when we look at this passage in the Gospel of John, you see the fact that God is, and we talked about this last week, doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing by bringing light into the world. He brings light and truth into the world through Jesus Christ. But you know the thing about light is light can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing to us. It can be a good thing because it shows us what we are unable to see apart from it. You know, when you're walking around at night, you have a vague understanding of where the furniture is until your pinky toe finds it, right? You have a vague understanding of what things might look like and the appearance of things. You see shadows at night. But when the light comes, you are given a full revelation. And that full revelation can be good so that you avoid stubbing your toe, but it can be bad when you look in the mirror. Uh, nobody has that experience? You all have a wonderful experience when you look in the mirror? You go, oh, I thought I looked good. And I've told you this before. How many of you have walked out? thinking you had two black socks on and one was navy blue and one was black when you get into the real light there. I actually have to take it up against several different lights. Because have you know white light and then the soft white light and then the fluorescent light all give off a different appearance of what, it, what I'm actually wearing. And then when I got it, then you got to kind of own it, right? When you got it on you and you're like, yeah, look at my socks. I meant to do this. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, Aunt Ronnie, that one time you came to a family function wearing two different shoes. So that's my family right there. Uh, but we all have that. And I went, how did you not know that you had two different shoes on? But when that light comes, the light reveals the truth. Now, when you have the truth revealed to you, you only have, you only have two options, right? The first option is to accept the truth. And the second option is to ignore the truth. And the Bible tells us, John goes on to say in the third chapter, that this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to see the truth. Maybe because they couldn't handle the truth. But see, the wonderful thing about Jesus and how he deals with truth, because I love telling people the truth. I love telling people the truth. I'm not very graceful about it. I will tell you, that's an ugly outfit. Why did you wear that? Okay, you know, I, I, I'm kind of, you know, just kind of abrasive at times there. I know you could never have told that I'm yeah. abrasive there. But the thing about Jesus is he doesn't only bring truth, but the Bible says he brings grace along with that truth. In other words, he tells us, yeah, that's an ugly Christmas sweater. Take it off and put this on instead. But we have to, but that requires a degree of humility, doesn't it? That requires a degree of letting God be God and us stepping back and taking, getting ourselves off of the throne. See, one of the things is that we talk about vacation from Christmas as we know it is, I wonder whether or not we're actually worshiping Jesus or we're worshiping a holiday. It seems like a lot of our celebrations are all about worshiping a holiday, and we have placed a holiday as Put and place that on the throne rather than Jesus. Because when you look at the um, just the sheer amount of money that is spent 
all in the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who was born in a cattle stall, who was born and laid in a lowly manger. Something's askew. Something's awry there. And I don't want to hear that the world it has a war on Christmas. I don't want to hear that anymore. The church has dismissed the real true meaning of Christmas. Where are the problem? You know, when things are dark, you don't blame darkness. You blame the light. If it's dark, you turn on the light. If there's a problem, you find a solution. And you know what Jesus says? We are the light of the world. He's the light, and he has placed his light within us, and that light is supposed to shine in the darkness. And here's the thing. If we are shining, see, this is what the word says, the darkness can't overcome the light. So if the darkness seems to be prevailing, it isn't that the darkness is winning, it's that the light isn't shining. And so the vacation from Christmas as we know it is actually understanding that our whole fundamental idea about Christmas, I believe, is flawed from the beginning to the end. I believe the stress that we impose upon one another, and we impose it upon ourselves, and impose it upon one another, is actually a sin. Because we're celebrating the birthday, the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Like, just stand amazed at that. But when was the last time you stood amazed at Christmas? I can't tell you when the last time I was. I can't tell you because you know what? I'm too busy to stand amazed. And there's too many Christmas movies on to stand amazed. And I'm too busy trying to create a Hallmark holiday, a Martha Stewart Christmas out of something that wasn't intended to be about that. It wasn't intended to be about all of our traditions at all. And we always have to be willing to embrace a new thing. You have to be willing to take off the ugly Christmas sweater before you could ever be given the new garment. Jesus offers us a new garment. He offers us a new way of doing things, a new way of living. But are we willing to get rid of the ugly Christmas sweater? Or are we going to stand on the other? Because you know why we hold on to this? Because we think it looks good. <laughs> it's when we're going to be on the other side of eternity when we look back and we'll go, wow, what was I wearing? And more, more sadly, what was I doing? So we tend to miss out on that true meaning of Christmas here. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. You know, when we, when we speak about this passage, traditionally we speak of this passage in, refers, in reference to the Jews. The Jewish people were waiting for a promised Savior and a promised Messiah. But you know... There is nothing new under the sun, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us. In other words, we are creatures of habit, and we repeat the same patterns of behavior. You know why? Because those ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it, and we are very ignorant people. And I'm talking about we, and I'm casting a very broad light, because we are one of the most bibli biblically ignorant people and biblically ignorant societies out there. Because all we do about God and know about God is mainly about what other people have told us about him, but we've never sought him out ourselves. If we did, we might have sought him out the way that we kind of go into the pool with a little bit, in, little bit at a time, little bit at a time, and then we go, ooh, got too cold, got to go back, okay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you start getting to know God, that's how it starts feeling, because you start going into this realm of the unknown. And so what we do is we surround ourselves with what is known. And the greatest thing that we surround ourselves with what is known are traditions. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. But look what happens when we do that. I believe the same thing happens for that, that happened to the Israelites happens to us. The world didn't receive them. The Israelites didn't recognize them. We don't recognize him. What if? Not what if. He is dwelling among us. And we have failed to see his glory. We have failed to see his light. 
And maybe we have accepted an imitation light because here's the thing. Remember I told you about those socks and you have to put them up against several different types of light to try to figure out which one. How many of you ever stepped on a scale? <laughs> How many of you have stepped on multiple scales to get the answer you wanted? How many of you have stepped on it multiple times to get the answer you wanted? And you can do this. I had one that if I stepped on with my left foot first, and then kind of put the right foot this way, it would go down and I would go, oh, I feel so good about myself. Because isn't it amazing when you step on that scale and it goes down, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I got it. But then, if that scale goes up a little bit, you're like, I'm fat, I'm dopey, and nobody's going to love me. I might as well eat the donut, right? Does it, don't you see a different image in your mind? See, I grew up as a fat kid, so I always see myself as a fat guy. Like, in my brain, I'm always there, I'm a fat guy. But when that scale goes up, I'm a fatter guy. All right? That's what we tend to do when it comes to faith. We find the scale that fits us. We find the light that tells us what we wanted to see. We find the preacher that tells us what we want to hear. We find the music that makes us feel the way that we wanted to feel, right? We do all this stuff. We go shopping around for truth, but truth is not something that is shopped around. Truth is something that is revealed. It is revealed through a revelation, and it is a revelation that has to be sought after. Otherwise, you miss it. Imagine spending a lifetime missing the point. And how many people, and I'm not talking about the world, because, you know, Paul actually said, don't bother talking about the world. The world's a world. I'm really concerned about the peeps in the church. I'm really concerned about the people that think that they're a sheep when they're really a goat. Because you might look like them. You might act like them. But are you really in? And that's a matter of the heart, not a matter of the outward appearance. Man judges outward appearance. God judges the heart. And so when we look at our hearts and how do we compare our hearts, how do we get a revelation about our hearts? Well, the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful and wicked. And so therefore, we can't get a revelation about our heart because our heart's going to lie to us. The only way to know about our hearts is not to listen to it, but to listen to God. And what does God want to do with our heart? He, he needs to give us a new one. The heart is beyond redemption. It needs to be replaced. And you don't want to just replace a valve here and there. Because you know what happens when you replace... How many of you tried to put in... You, you know, it's Christmas time and batteries not included. And you only had three <coughs> AA batteries and you needed four. And so you take a used AA battery and you put it with the three good AA batteries. What happens? It doesn't work right. It, it drains the battery life out of all of it. How many of us are doing that in our lives? And we try to put a little bit of the good stuff with a little bit of the bad stuff. And you know what? It spoils the whole batch. And many of us are living in that place. And you know, it's the religious people. Look what it says, Matthew 23. You want to get smacked upside your head. You want to see why they ended up crucifying Jesus. Just read Matthew 23. That's one of the main things. He gets so mad at the religious folk. He gets mad at the Pharisees, and it's the seven woes. Woe to you. In other words, hey, you're all messed up. Knock it off. That's what the woe is. You're messed up, knock it off. Woe to you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, you major on the minor, and you minor on the major. The things that you should be doing, you have ignored, and you replace it with the things that you want to do, and you make it sound like it's a sacrifice, <clears throat> to somehow cover up not dealing with the rest of the junk in your life, right? Let, let me give you an example. Not saying it because we do choir, right? You could, you could be in choir and you go, oh, it's a sacrifice. Every Wednesday night, got to go to choir. And I'm, I'm singing and I'm doing all that stuff. Good, do the choir. Don't throw out the choir, but don't think that the choir takes the place of everything else that God has told you to do. I love when people love picking out, actually I hate when people love picking out, little pieces of scripture to throw it out at other people. I made this comment to a fellow pastor this week. He said, you know, when the Bible says that it's a double-edged sword, sharper than any double-edged sword, as a child, this was always my mental image, that it was a sword without a handle, 
that in order to touch it, the only way to handle the sword was to cut yourself first. And so that if you use that sword to use it to cut somebody else, you're going to cut yourself first. See, the Bible cut, cuts our attitudes. It cuts our issues. God has enough revelation to give to you than to give you revelation about somebody else. Amen. And you know, with the holidays around the corner, let's just let that settle in for a moment. As you're going to be surrounded by family mm. or friends. <laughs> that God wants to give you a word for you. And he wants to change you despite everybody else around you. Because you don't know what he's doing in the lives of other people around you. And it's none of your business. Because you can barely, right? We can barely understand what he's doing within us until we get to the other side. And then we go, aha, that's what you were doing the whole time. I thought you were just turning out the lights just to turn out the lights. The whole thing was he had to turn off the circuit breaker so that he could re replace some fuses. How about that, Roger? That was a good I got it there. Right? You don't want to be playing with electric unless you're going to turn out the entire power, right? And so sometimes the lights have to go out for God to do a new thing. But we always want to, but even when we do a new thing, here's what we tend to do. We cry out for a new thing. Remember the Israelites, they cried out for a new thing? And they go, we want to get out of Egypt. It's bad here. It's hard. Then they get out. But it didn't get out the way that they thought that it would happen. And then they want to go back and they say, it was so much better back then. They're... You know what? Well, yeah, it was a little hard, but we had garlic, leeks, and onions. Imagine kissing. <laughs> Not very fun. They wanted to go back. Isn't that how we are? The very things that we pray, God, I want a new revelation. I want to know you. But you know what? In order to get to that point, you have to let go. And we're not very good at let going. But what we do is we try to hold on two things over here, and we try to hold on to God with another hand over here, and you know what ends up happening? We get pulled in different directions, and we just feel tortured. How many Christians feel tortured? How many of you feel tortured? You go, well, I'm promised a life of peace, and joy, and love. I'm promised these things. Why am I not experiencing them? You're not experiencing them because... God isn't faithful, you're experiencing them because you are not faithful. You're all in or you're all out, and you can't return to the way that it used to be. But in this, in this scene, you will see how we many times take those family traditions and we always try to make it look so wonderful when it's not so wonderful after all. <laughs> Before we begin, since this is Aunt Bethany's 80th Christmas, I think she should lead us in the saying of grace. Oh, oh. Great. Oh. What, dear? Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say grace. The blessing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 <sighs> Catherine, this turkey tastes half as good as it looks. I think we're all in for a very big treat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Save the neck for me, Clark. <laughs> okay, Eddie. Look at that. 
<laughs> Sorry. Why are you crying? Huh? I told you we put it in too early. Oh, it's just a little dry. It's fine. I told you. All right, so none of you have had that quite a bad experience, have you? Maybe, maybe close to it, close to it there. But, you know, there's several things that I pick up right away from that clip. Is one, um, you got to love the crazy ant there. Mine's right there. All right? The crazy, lovable ant, okay? Um, but, so you gotta, you gotta love the aunt, and she's asked to give the blessing, and uh, one, she doesn't understand what she's asked to give, right? She can't quite perceive and hear it, right? And he has to go, the blessing! Right? Yeah. And then the second thing is, when she does give the blessing, she does something, she reverts to something that she has previously memorized and done before, right? I pledge allegiance to the flag. And she reverts to that. So you got the first problem there. Then the second problem is, okay, let's try to have that beautiful turkey. The turkey looks beautiful on the outside, but it wasn't done properly. It wasn't cooked properly. And so then Christmas dinner is ruined. Now, how do we look at that within our own lives? Well, the first thing is when we, we look at Christmas as being a time of worship, but you can't worship something you don't know. You can't worship something you don't know. The fact of the matter is, uh, the Bible tells us that we are created to be worshipers. That is something inherent within our creation. But I need you to all to understand something, that we all worship something. Oh, it's playing off of my iPhone. Why is my iPhone playing because of that? <laughs> Uh, it's a good song. All right. So, uh, so it's by Bluetooth. See, you don't know when you are sending out a wave and it's being dis and it's disconnecting something else there. I turned off my Bluetooth now. We'll see if it works. Okay. So, but that was a good song. It's called A Beautiful Day. You gotta wake up to it in the morning. All right. Because uh, by the time I get out of bed, I'm already miserable. So, going back to the sermon. See, Christmas, uh, vacation from Christmas as we know it. These are sermons from as you know it, okay? But you can't, wor we're all worshipers. We all worship something. And the, the biggest sin, remember, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other God before me. And that's the one that we break all the time. People go, well, that's not true. Yeah, that it is. What's a God? The God is everything that dictates your life other than him. So the people that might not might have been here this morning and there is some reason why they did it, and they'll all give me some kind of excuse. Maybe they won't. That's a God. You just made you just took God and placed him before. And you know what? Just call it for what it is. Don't pretend that it's something else. It is what it is. You've created an idol in your life. Maybe your children are the idol. Maybe the Ding, ding, ding. Maybe there... I think there's a lot of people that have children as their eye over there. Maybe, maybe, good thing I can roll with punches here. Is that another phone ringing? I'll just sit down and let everybody answer the phone. All right. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your dreams. Maybe it's that ideal family moment. Whatever it is. We're all created to worship. And so here's the thing. Are we, as we look at Christmas, are we worshiping Jesus or the party? Are we just going through the rituals like Aunt Betty, right? And going through and, oh, we want you to say the blessing and we revert to what we know rather than beginning to explore what we don't know. I'll tell you something as it's been in my Christian walk and this puts me at odds with a lot of people. I'll just, I know that surprises you too. But the more that I have, and more and longer that I've walked with Jesus, and I gotta say the more in depth that I tried to go there, the more ambiguity that there is and the less certainty in my faith. More ambiguity, less certainty. My faith is secure in Jesus, but in terms of what I know, I recognize more and more each day the breadth and the depth of that which I don't know. Now that's going to lead you into one of two places. Either it's going to scare you back into Egypt, or it's going to push you ahead to trust in God full, more fully. And to say, you know what, it's okay if I make a mistake. It's okay as long as I'm trying. As long as I'm, as if I'm seeking. We're all on a journey. 
But the fact of the matter is a lot of times I think that we've ended up worshiping our religion more than worshiping the Father, worshiping the Son. This is what it says in Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they have been taught. So what we do is based upon what we've been taught, not based upon an experience. You don't, some people go, well, I, when I do the pre-marriage counseling, which I can't stand, okay, and I do that, and they say, well, I want, some people say, I want what my parents have, and some people say, I don't want what my parents have. But you know what they never really say? We want to write our own book. We want to start off a new thing. We're always looking back to somebody else. We're always comparing and contrasting. What if God wants to do a brand new thing? Because he does want to do a brand new thing. The story that he has written for somebody else, that's their story. And God wants to write a new story in you. But as long as we are sitting there holding on to the, the old traditions and the things that we've been taught, then we will never truly let go to experience the depth of his grace. To experience the breath of his mercy. To experience that love which transcends all understanding. As long as we want to keep him in a box, we will never experience who he truly is. And so John 4.23, Jesus says, A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. It doesn't matter the location. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't even matter how you're doing it. It matters the attitude by which we come. It matters the attitude, because God's looking at that heart. So how we present ourselves. And you know what? The Bible tells us a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. How many of us have broken hearts? You all do. We just cover it up different ways. But we all have broken hearts. We all have regrets. We all have failures. We all have all that stuff. And how many of us, we sit there and we hide it. We try to have like that National Lampoon's Christmas vacation. And we try to make things look like everything's peachy keen. It isn't. And it's okay that it isn't. Yeah, actually, you know, the Bible says there's a time for everything. A time for mourning and a time for dancing. And joy does come in the morning, but you got to go through the night before you get to the morning. But what God delights in are the worshipers who choose to worship Him in spirit and truth. Choose to come before Him just as they are. And say, here I am, God. I need you. And I'm desperate for you. And it's not enough to say, I need you, God. Just like it's not enough to go to the doctor, you got, actually got to take the prescription. Mm -hmm. Second thing that we need to pay attention to here is we got to spend less. Do our festivities reflect that worship? Coming to church here is not worship. I got news flash for you. This is entertainment for all of you. I know it's that bad. This is your entertainment. This sweater, this guy, it's entertainment. But let's face it, let, let's look at the attitude by which most of us come to worship. I'm going to take cell phones next week. For being there. I'm going to have a den, including my own, because we had my song playing. But, here, but here's the thing about, about how we come. Most of us come in frazzled. We're late. We are thinking about what we got to do afterwards. We are thinking about tomorrow. Right now, you're all hungry. You know, all, all this stuff, you're not coming into work. That's not worship. You think God's like, oh, they showed up in a seat today. I'm so happy. <laughs> no. No, if you really wanted to come worship, one, this is an extension of our lifestyle. Worshippers do it all the time. I am not a human being some of the time. I'm Well, hopefully I'm a human being all the time. Some people think I'm other things. But I'm a human being all the time. You're not a worshiper some of the time. You're a worshiper all the time, as I said. And so you're worshiping something. If you want to worship God, you've got to do it His way, not your way. And so therefore, it always strikes me, if Christmas is about the birthday of Jesus, and you showed up to my birthday party and served me something I didn't like, not saying my family hasn't done that. <laughs> Y'all know, right? They've done that. Okay? And 
I go, whose birthday are we celebrating here? I don't like onions in my pizza. Why are we eating onions in my pizza? Because you all like it. I don't, but it's my birthday. Whose birthday are we celebrating? Whose party is it? Why are we doing this? So, 1 Samuel 15, 22, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. This is a story of how King Saul gets rejected as king of Israel because God told him to do something this way. He said, I want you to go in. I want you to demolish everything. I want you to do it this exactly this way. And what did Saul do? He goes, well, I'm going I'm to change it up a little bit. He changed it up a little bit. And then he used piety and religion to cover it up as if it wouldn't be a stench in the nostrils of God. All that is is lemon scented poo. Or, uh, excuse me, you never know when it's going to come back. And some of you are like, what's lemon scented poo? You'll know it when you smell it. But anyway, Samuel goes to him. The prophet says, what did you do? Why are you doing this? And Saul goes, well, I thought I could please God. You know, maybe, maybe I could do what I want and then I'll go to church on Sunday. Maybe I'll go do what I want. Maybe I'll come to Christmas Eve. Maybe I'll do all this stuff. And maybe I'll make myself a God because let's face it, that's our biggest God that we deal with. And then I will add all this stuff in there. God wants your obedience. Amen. You're in, and 98% obedience is 100% disobedience. Amen. Let me let that sit on you for a moment. 98% obedience is 100% disobedience. How does that change how we look at ourselves? And might we look at ourselves radically different and stop looking at other people because we recognize how radically disobedient we are. And let's take care of the plank in our own eye before we worry about the speck in our brothers. And so then we are also told of Romans 12 too, do not conform by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. That is the attitude that God wants. He wants a different mindset. Who cares if people say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays? Amen. Doesn't matter. I don't care. Amen. Because actually, Xmas, by the way, Xmas actually goes back to Romans. Christ. Okay, you, you actually go back. Yeah, you know, that's where we got to click on the brain there a little bit. Okay, I know, but let's fight a war against a Starbucks cup. Oh, they're taking Jesus out of coffee. Forget about the pagan lady on the front of the cup. Let's have a Christmas tree. And let's wonder why we have Christmas trees in the first place and all that stuff. You know what? Because it, it's just silly distractions. I listen to Christians all the time and I go, Ew. I don't like that. I don't like what we sound like. I don't like what we stand for. I don't like the things that we say. I get to go, No. No, what, what is it that God wants? He wants us to be new creations. Transformed. And how do we transform ourselves? By the renewing of our mind. How? By getting in God's word. And you know what God's word said? Don't worry about that stuff. That's not the stuff he's worried about. What does the Lord demand of you? But to do justice. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. That's what God commands of us. Period. Kind of makes it easy there. We just like to complicate the simple. Because then we get martyrdom complexes. And if we get martyrdom complexes, then we can have a pity party. And if we can have a pity party, then it's no longer his party, it's my party. All right? So, next, give more. What does God actually want from us? What does he want of you? Well, he wants you. He wants all of you, not 98%, he wants all of you. Isaiah 58, 6 or 7, this, when we talk about fasting, take the word fasting out and put in religion, put in ritual, put in tradition. Is this not the kind of religion I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Ooh. That last part, you got to deal with your family. 
I wish I could just have to deal with everybody else. Sometimes it's easier to deal with the homeless people than it is with my family. Right, Aunt Ronnie? Amen. Amen. But you can't turn away from your own flesh and blood because you know what? Ministry starts here. It starts with this step. And it goes out the door. And here's the other thing. It pays no regard to what the other person may or may not be doing. It is simply what God wants. It's his party. We get to do what he wants. And you and I benefit from poverty. We benefit from oppressing other people. And if you want to know how, just look at those rollback prices and see how they rolled back. They rolled on, on top of somebody else's back so that you can get a cheaper price for clothing that you're going to throw away in a year because it's going to be in that clothing closet. <laughs> we saw some of your Christmas presents from last year in there. Angela's wearing one. Okay. <laughs> so, God wants us to actually do something. Don't just say, thank you, Jesus. Or how about those birthday cakes for Jesus? And people go, well, Pastor, that's reminding us of the... You don't need a cake. You need to go do what he told you to do. That's how you know you're in or you're out. But you're just taking all the joy out of it. No, I'm telling you how to find the joy in it. If you think that this takes all the joy out of it, i got to ask you something. How joyful and triumphant have you been feeling lately? <laughs> how joyful and triumphant do your, do your traditions make you feel? Because I know a lot of people that say, I can't wait for Christmas to be over. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. That means... You're the problem, not Christmas. So, last slide. And everyone goes, yay! Yes. All right. Be careful, because this is what I want you to know. Love all, including me. All right? That's our response to the gift. We love everybody, and we love at all times. And this is how we love. See, when people say, I love you, I can't stand when they tell me they love me, because I know that they don't love me. I've had family members that tell me that they love me, and I go, you don't love me, because you don't know me. You can't love someone you don't know. Yes, there's someone in the kitchen making something. So everybody can look over. <laughs> yes, now we can look back. All right. But you can't love someone you don't know. And I love when Christians walk around telling people that they love them and, you know, or God loves you and so do I. No, you don't. I don't love them and I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to love people and I don't. But... That, I'm supposed, that is the only response to love, because when I understand how much God has loved me, then I will dispense that love to one another, to other people, because it's no longer, this world's understanding of love is based upon reciprocity. That is, I love you because of how you make me feel, how you, maybe we look like each other, we act like each other, we sound like each other, maybe I love you because you don't look like me, you know, maybe that type of thing. The idea of God's love is that he loves us regardless of our ability to express it back. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, enemies to God. Somebody, some kid knocked into me the other day and said, my bad. I want to slap him upside and say, not my bad, just say, I'm sorry. But how many of us use our prayers and go, my bad? It's a whoops. It's disobedience. It's rebellion. And it's what Jesus died for. And every time we do it, we are driving that hammer into his hand. John 13, 34 through 35, we get a new command, which actually you go, why is it a new command? Because you kind of understand it's a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must also love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How many times did Jesus just have to say love one another in there because we won't get it. We're like, and he says, love one another. Here's the new commandment part, as I have loved you. How did he love us? He loved us first without any regard for reciprocity. He continues to love us even though we continue to spit in his face. He continues to love us no matter what. And that, my friends, not the ugly Christmas sweater, not Merry Christmas, and not whatever you're drinking your caffeine drug out of. is. And I like that caffeine drug. Don's a real druggie over there. <laughs> Don actually died five years ago. This is just caffeine. He just went on caffeine. But, 
But here's the thing, and so don't judge him because I know all of you. You do it too. But and I do it. I drink coffee every morning. But here that's what you're gonna say amen to. <laughs> that's what you chose. Out of the whole sermon, drink coffee every morning, amen. <laughs> By this all men shall know we are his disciples. <laughs> we are one with the coffee. We are one with the cup. Alright, but yeah, you've been sitting up front. You went from back to front. But here's the thing. That's how they know. That's how the world knows that we belong to him because it's a different type of love. It's a different type of thing. And so, my friends, however your Christmas ends up this year, however your parties end up, Jesus comes. He's here. He's with us. He's for us. And that's all the reason to party. So let's look at this last scene, and hopefully we don't hear my song. Uh, Jimmy? Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive and where it's okay to not be okay, really.